I'm telling you, you could hear so if you could retain it, but I, you know, I have to have notes. <laughs> well, I'm excited to be here, at, man, just to be able to minister with Shirley. Uh, and just been so instrumental in my life. Um, just you know, so her words have just come in such awesome times, and um, her words have not any of them have fallen to the ground. So. Yeah. She's been so key in giving me the word of the Lord, and, and uh, just feel like she's just such a, a friend, somebody I trust. As a pastor, I don't know if you really know what it means to sort of turn over your pulpit um, to somebody, but I've turned it over to Shirley several times without even being there. Uh, so I'm not being a hound dog, just trying to watch her and make sure she does everything right. <laughs> but just, uh, just say, Shirley, I can't be there. Will you, will you fill in for me? So that just shows how much trust I have for her and, and just her hunger for the Lord and for a move of God is just so exciting. Amen. And I uh, appreciate Orman so much. Just what a mighty man of God. I don't think we realize how awesome Amen. he is. Amen. Thank you, honey. And just, uh, just loves the Lord and such a servant and, and uh, so uh, pushes his wife out there to be able to fulfill her destiny. Yet he's fulfilling his own as well. And then all... To just talk about Jill, just uh, I feel like she's been a sister to me, and just love her so much. I feel like she's has such a gentle, loving spirit, but she's so powerful um, when she ministers and just uh, carries just a, a big stick in the spirit. And I appreciate her, and um, I know she's got some powerful words for this weekend. And got to know uh, Michael as well since they've been united, and uh, they ministered to my church a few months back and appreciate him and his heart and just give him some key words as well. So I get to kick off this um, this and uh, I just, boy, of course we all, when you come to something like this, you all have little things that you could say, well, is that a battle or is that a, is that a attack? But it's been a crazy week and, and um, so Lord, I believe has something powerful for this week. Uh, uh, our basement flooded, air conditioning and furnace went out. So uh, air conditioning and the, I mean the furnace particularly was out while it was freezing cold and, oh. and the basement was flooding um, as the sprinkler system broke. And, um, and then this morning uh, uh, a tire came totally off the wheel, a brand new tire just about three months ago. And uh, broke the bead and everything, and we stuck, you know, stuck with only one car, and seven people going seven different directions today. So, but I, I know God has something, and um, I'm just trying to really key on what God has, because I really feel like He's given me, and they sort of tie in together. But which way to go is what I'm really praying about, because um, some of the things that already happened are definitely things that God put on my heart as far as uh, to minister on, but also. He uh, gave me more of a prophetic message, and just trying to decide which way to go. But I think I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna share the prophetic message, yes. and um, um, I'm gonna share it the way the Lord gave it to me. A lot of times, you know, I, I'm a pastor. I feel like there's an apostolic uh, call in my life. I feel like you know there's been the prophetic, and uh, but. Sometimes I flow in the prophetic in different ways as well, and I feel like this is just the whole message that God downloaded. And a lot of times I'm in the spirit of praying, and then He just says, "Get your pen out and notebook," and begins to start downloading some some things that are just so powerful and just overwhelming to me. And yet also beyond that, just you know, evangelistic and pastoral. So my heart is is um, let, let me just start. Go to Mark chapter 16, and um, I believe that you're here because you want to be equipped to do um, to go deeper in the Lord, and um, I believe that's what it is about. I know Shirley's heart, and so many of you being here on a Friday afternoon, I'm sure you you uh, just hungry for God and want to see some powerful things. And uh, this passage and many others have touched my life, and I guess I'm one of those guys that when I when I share uh, when I'm reading. I sort of go to the Lord and say, okay, that's powerful. And if it's happening, praise God, and I rejoice. If it's not, and I say, okay, what's the problem here? Is it, uh, is it that you're not telling the whole truth? Which, of course, then I always come to the conclusion that that's not true. 
Um, is it my fault? Is it something weak in my part? Is it something that I'm not embracing or, or demonstrating or stepping out in? And um, so that's the way I approach the word because if God said it, I believe it's true. It's just an amen that I believe and I believe God has some power. So let me take you to this just to give you the premise for where I'm coming from as I was approaching the Lord for this conference. I just said, Lord, I just believe that we're in strategic times, desperate times. Uh, you know, who could say this is the end times? I don't know if that's true or not, but I do know it seems like things are escalating and it's coming pretty intense. And I believe that we can't play games. When you got ISIS coming into America, and you, but yet you know and you read the reports of missionaries, what's going on in other countries, the little six-year-olds are being challenged to deny the Lord, and if not, their heads are being cut off, and those five- and six-year-olds aren't denying the Lord, and uh, they're just dying right before their parents. You know, um, we got to be pretty foolish if we think that, you know, we're just going to escape here and make it so easy in America. I believe that that we've got to be ready, we've got to be equipped. And um, so, before I read that, let me just share another uh, thing that, you know, I, we were just singing about the army of the Lord. I believe that God wants to raise up an army. And I have a very good friend I've, I've ministered with before, but many of you know him. As, he's an apostle, his apostle John Kelly. And a, he wrote a, bo uh, a book about just the end time warriors. And um, I don't know if you read that book, but it's, it's got something that I don't want to be hesitating share because I'm not here to be graphic or rude or crude, but it's pretty significant. He says that um, what's happening in the days that we're living in is that many ministers, pastors, like, like God's ready to raise up the army and many are gathered and he's looking for who is the ones that are going to be the generals to step out. And yet what's happening, he saw a vision that pastors and leaders were gathered together and they were standing in a circle facing each other. Mm -hmm. And they were looking at each other, and they were all standing there. And just please forgive me if this is, this is wrong, but, you know, too crude. But he said that the vision of God shared him, it's in his book, said that the pastors were just sitting there shooting their seed into the middle of the circle to see who was the greatest and the biggest and the toughest and the strongest. Mm -hmm. And yet the whole world around him was dying. And he said that God was looking for an army, and he said there was this disheveled group over here, seemed like they weren't really together, but they were starting to get things getting ready, and all of a sudden that God was using them, because they were the ones that were willing to be the remnant, and that they weren't being disheveled, but they were gathering, getting ready, and that they were looking outward, that they were standing, not looking inward and saying, I'm better than you, i got a bigger church, i got the best ministry, I got, I'm got, i more prophetic, I'm all that. He said they were standing out, and they became and he was from the military, became what's called in the military the wedge breakers, that they were the ones that became like, like the, the pointed ones that were leading out, and they were the ones that went forward, and the wedge breakers that broke forward into the enemy's camp and were able to, to lead the, the bride of Christ to, to victory. And that's what I believe. That's where my heart is. I you know, want to see that happen. I want you to be trained, equipped, and released. And so um, going back to Mark chapter 16, verse 15, he said to them, go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. Okay, so it's not saying those that have been Christians for, you know, 30 years. It's not saying those that have a label or a title of prophet or uh, apostle. It's saying those who believe. Amen. So when that, that hits me, I'm going, well, I'm a pastor, man. I... I that's not about me. It's about what can I do to get my people, to get the body of Christ ready, that if you believe, then you've got to be doing these things. Because that's what the Bible said. So he said, and these signs will accompany those who believe in my name. They will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. So everyone in this room, if you're a believer, and I said, who believes, you raise your hand, then every one of us should be doing all of these. Amen. Amen. That's what I, and that doesn't mean that I have to be in, go to seminary or be any of that. It means that when I begin to follow Christ, I have just as much right to walk in that and have those accompany my life as somebody who's, you know, you know, schooled and, 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 and trained and been doing the ministry for years. Right? 
Right. So that's my goal. That's why I'm here. I want to be able to see that happen. So I just cried out to the Lord. I said, Lord, I want to see people walking that out. Why aren't we seeing more of the power? And this is the prophetic message that the Lord gave me. It's a little bit different. I love to preach. I'm a preacher, so I had a message. But I need to share this. And this, I'm going to give it, download it the way the Lord gave it to me. Yes, my children, I will do great and mighty things in these last days. And my children who desire holiness and righteousness, who live and dwell in my word and walk minute by minute and day by day in my spirit, anointing and presence, will see my glory and my power. Amen. So that's how we begin. He said, yes, yes, I, I will release that. But those, there's a stipulation in there. Those that will pursue him, those that will walk in holiness and righteousness, those that will get rid of the things that have passed. Those who will, will pursue the Lord. And God said, if you begin to separate yourselves, you know, don't give the devil any play in your life. Don't give him any room in your life. But begin to go up to God. God's saying, look, I'm going to show and reveal to you my, my light, my glory, my power, and my presence. And that's where I'm after. So he said, you got to walk minute by minute and day by day. So we're not taking breaks. We're not taking, uh, you know... Vacation for God. We're going after it. Amen? Amen. He said, he continued, and I promise as I spoke, I will do far greater things this day through my many children than I did through my son. You ask, how can this be? Well, my son was only one man, and he did the greatest feats of faith. What more is there? It is when my holy remnant goes out equipped, unified, like an army, and stands on my word and my promises, and as a vast and unified army, go out across the country and walk in my spirit, and the reports of many will be astounded. Not a church, not a city, not a state, but a world. Amen. God said we're going to change the world. When we, when we really come together and we go after God, you know, how, how, that scripture's always got me. John 14, 12. Behold, I go to the Father, and I send you the Holy Spirit, so you can do greater things than I've done. Well, he did so many great, mighty things. So what is he saying? He's saying that we can, but it's really not just that I'm in the competition to try to outdo what Jesus did, but it's that we together become the army unified, and when we're all doing it, when you're invading every part that you go to, when you're going to every part, people group, and every sphere of influence, and you're doing what God's asked you to do, and we're all doing it, it's going to astound, not just the city, transformation of a city, it's not going to just transform a, a state or, you know, just a country, it's going to transform the whole world, amen? Amen. That's what our goal is today. But you, my children, must heed this word. My spirit will not compete with you or any individual for my glory. He said, you must walk in brokenness and humility. Pride, ego, self, they must go. Amen. He said, I can only fill empty vessels, vessels that are drained of the flesh. For you ask, where is my spirit's power? And again, I want to refer you to the passage of the woman whose husband had died and gone on, and, and the prophet comes, and, you know, they're trying to steal, you know, take her kids and, you know, her two boys and go and, and make and pay off her debt. And the prophet comes and says, go get as many vessels as you can. And this little bit of oil, it's not going to run out. You know what? It, it never ran out as long as there were empty vessels. You know what? I, I, we need to ask ourselves, how much do we live by the Spirit and how much do we live by the flesh? Yes. Is my life 50-50, 50% me live with my life, 50% I live for the Lord, is it 90-10, 10-90, or what is it? But God wants us to get to a point where we're empty, and the more we're empty, we decrease that He might increase. Amen. Amen. So, He goes on and he says, the reason you don't see more gifts of wisdom, knowledge, discernment, prophecy, tongues, and interpretation is because there is too much. And here I'm going to read them. These are what I call the revelatory gifts. When I get a word of wisdom for you, you know, all of a sudden God's giving me something, some insight into your life. I begin to share that with you. And wow, where did that come from? It wasn't from the, my own wisdom. It was from the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. Uh, when I get a, when I get, you know, people who speak in tongues and there's a word of prophecy and it's interpreted and in prophetic words, you know, really, if it's if it's going to make the impact that it should, it doesn't come from man. It doesn't come from my perception. It doesn't come from oh, having a little bit of knowledge about you. It comes from really being yielded to the Holy Spirit. 
And my thing is this, why don't we see more of this? If I go back to Mark chapter 16, why don't we see more of these gifts, these, the power? Why don't we see more of this? So I asked the Lord, why? why? Why are not children, more children prophesying? Why are not more adults, you know, want more youth walking on their campuses and, and instead of being, you know, manipulated or, or swayed to follow the way of the world, where are the Christians that are going to rise up and these young men and women that are going to just take back their schools for Jesus? Ooh, amen? Amen. So, remember, wisdom, knowledge, discerning the spirits, prophecy, tongues, and interpretation... The reason we don't see more. You want to hear the reason? Yeah. You ready for it? Yep. Yeah. It's from the Lord. Gossip. There's too much gossip. Amen. Wow. Okay, why, 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 do I, why does he say that? Because if God's going to give me something about somebody else, yeah. if I have a tongue that wags, you know, in gossip, why would he want to trust me with that? If all of a sudden it's only information that I might give it to you still, but I give it to you and then I take it, and, and I go tell everybody else about it. Or, or I'm gossiping about you already. And all of a sudden God's going to give me, uh, you know, I'm asking God to give me words of wisdom. And God's saying, you know what, you've already been gossiping about that person. How can you minister to them and get a pure word of God when you're over here gossiping about them? The people, this, this hope was, opens the door for what God wants this weekend. Second, envy. There's too much envy in the body of Christ. Mm. We're envying. Well, God, you know, I get a word and it's powerful for you. You're going to move mountains. You're going to do miracles. And if I got an envious spirit, I'm going, better than they are. I'm in mean, oh God, don't you know what they've been doing? Don't you know the sin that's in their life? Come on, God. And so I get envious. I'm like, oh, then I want to filter it. God said, I won't give it to people that are going to filter my word. I won't give it to people that are just going to let my word flow. Come Amen? On. So second, jealousy, which is this the same as envy. There's too much competition. Talking about what I shared earlier, pastors competing. People are competing. We're all looking about who is the great, who can give the best word, who can do this. You know what God's saying? Uh-uh. I'm not looking for that. I'm looking for people that will be my remnant, that will give a pure, undefiled word that will bring change. He said there's too much dissension. There's too much irreverence in the body of Christ. There's too much bitter root judgments. There's too much criticism. Too much factions and dissension as well as division, anger, lust, and, per, and uh, perversion. All those. I could stop at every one of them, but I want you to see what God's saying. He's saying the reason that there's not more of this just flowing of the Spirit is because we have these things in there, and God wants us. He's not condemning us. I'm not here to condemn. I don't believe this is a condemning word. I believe it's an encouraging word that God's saying Amen. every one of you should be given Amen. prophetic words, should be laying hands on the sick, that, that you all, you're going to people that I can't go to. Many people that I know, they want to just bring the sick to the church. Oh, pastor, you do it. Or, pastor, go to my house. Pastor, you go to, and I don't mind doing that. I would do that until, until I die. I love meeting the needs of people, but... What greater thing to have somebody come to church and go, Pastor, man, my grandma got sick, boom, we prayed for it, you know, what did we just happen here? You know, Jill just picked up some snow, put it on there, boom, no bruising. Why? That should be happening all Amen. the time with my, in all of our lives. So, when we're not really reverencing God, then why do we expect Him to give us a word? We have bitter root judgments against other people, against leadership. When we're criticizing the body cry, we're always tearing each other down, we're pointing the finger. When we have factions, dissensions, as well as division, anger, lust, perversion, don't you think that God's saying, I want to get this stuff out, but we're the ones that are stopping. We've got to get rid of it. Amen? Amen? These must be cleaned out, he said. You will come and come to me to be free, which we were just singing about freedom. But you only take a sprinkling of my blood rather than a whole bath in my blood. You say you trust me, but can I really trust you? So what he's saying is, is I want you to come and just get drenched in the blood of Jesus. I want you to come and just get so full of the, the, the Holy Spirit without measure. And he's saying, man, I'm going to wash you from head to toe. I'm going to clean you. I'm the one that can clean you inside and out. And that's what he wants to do. But then he says, you say you trust. Oh, Lord, I trust you. Lord, I trust you with this, I trust you with that. God's saying, but can I trust you? Are you going to be a pure vessel that's going to reflect me? Are you going to be someone who's going to represent me? Or are you going to filter the things that I give you based on your knowledge of people or based on your decision or based on the, the bitter judgments that you have? 
So this is for every one of us, from the smallest child to the, to the eldest person in this place. I hope you understand. Amen? Amen. Amen? So he said, you say you trust me, but can I really trust you? And he says, not till you cleanse yourself from everything that contaminates body and spirit, and you perfect holiness in the fear of God, which is 2 Corinthians 7, 1. I want, to tr I want to trust you, but only as you are truly surrendered to me. Can I? Now, I, I, I had to, I'm not, I, when God gave me this, man, I broke and wept as well. This is something that God's like, oh, God, man, I just want to, man, I want to just be able to walk on high school campus. I want to be able to walk, you know, I want to be able to see things. I don't want to ever be without having an answer to people that are desperate. So, please, this is just, I believe, God, God gave it to me, downloaded it to me, and and we got to receive it as it is. Amen. The reason we see so little faith, healing, miracles, and deliverance is because there's too many. These I call the power gifts. Where you just walk up and God uses you to, man, and faith to do something so significant. Or power, you know, just miracles, healing. Why don't we see more of that? He said there's too much pride. Mm. See, because if I'm used to go and Pray for your healing and God heals you. In fact, we just, to encourage you, shared yesterday, but, you know, I think with a couple people at the table we were at, but we had a man that was running our food bank. He was in the gangs, you know, did everything, you know, but here he is ministering, and all of a sudden, about uh, eight months ago, they found out he has cancer. And he said he had in his colon, and started there, and went to his liver, and they said he had stage four cancer. And um, scared, he's only 40 years old. And uh, so they go in, they take part of his colon out, take that out, got rid of it, then they put him on treatments, and, you know, um, and he was going to his, his doctor, and then they felt like there was just something wrong, so they switched to go to another doctor in Arizona, so they've been there for the last month and a half. And first the, the, the doctor in Arizona said, you know, uh, well, let's, get that, let's get that tumor out of your liver. had a big old tumor in his liver. So they went in to go get the tumor out of his liver, and when they got in there, they were saying it was too close to this something. They couldn't get the in there and do it, and uh, so the little robot hands, they said, they just couldn't get around it, so they said, we're just going to have to leave it and just figure out what we're going to do from here. They closed them up, and they felt like after a couple of weeks, they said, you know what, we're going to have to do whatever we can. We need to get that out. So just last week, they went in to go get that out, and when they... Went in there, all of a sudden the doctor opened up, my friend Steve, he walked away, went and got his wife, and he said, you need to come out here. And, uh, you know, of course, Steve was going, like, when you take your wife outside of the room, you're going, oh, man, how bad is it? And what the doctor told his wife was, I don't know what's going on, but there is no tumor, and he has a brand new liver. It's a brand new liver. It's not a tumor. <laughs> You know, I can tell you that I, I'm one of many that pray for him. And I praise God if one of my prayers helped. But when you want to be used in those kind of powerful gifts, if you have pride, you know what? God's probably going to put you on the sidelines for a little bit because he wants the glory. He doesn't want, he doesn't want us to take it. You see what I'm saying? There's too much arrogance, pride. These are all sort of twin times, but this is what he gave me. Pride, arrogance, and haughtiness. So there's too much of those in the body of Christ. That's why we don't see more faith and more miracles. And then he went on and he said there's too much selfishness. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. How does that affect my... Because when I'm always just thinking about me and I'm always just worried about what, what's going to benefit me, how am I going to get something, then I'm not thinking about you. So the reason is, is, is that I can't... You might share something that you had a great need. And I'm going, oh, that's great. And it goes in one and out the other. My compassion is gone because I'm so worried about my life and my situation. Right. I'm not sitting there thinking about you and going, oh, I need to stop right now and pray for you and see a miracle. Because I'm going, oh, man, I just had a bad day. I had a tire and I just came out of a wheel. I had a flood. You know, I'm like, you know, all of a sudden I'm thinking about that. And so I don't really, I'm not a vessel to be used at that moment. So get that in the right way that God's thing. He said there's too much man-pleasing spirit. Whoa. Yes. Yeah. So if I'm a man pleaser, I want to please everybody else. So then if God's, you know, you know, it's about him giving the glory and I'm just trying to impress people, 
I want to show you, I'm going to call out things, and it's not really, I'm not going to pray for you, and I'm going to say, oh, she's healed. I want to please. I want people to say, wow, you're awesome. That was great. And God's saying, you know what? I, I did it. He just can't use this that way. We've got to get this stuff out. And I'm going to go on. He said, there's too much selfish ambition. And he said, many of my people have a glory monging, monging spirit. Whoa. Wow. What is that again? Glory mongers. Is what it really was. He said, there's too much glory monger, you know, mongers. But what we want, it's like all puffed up about, I'm the one. I steal it from God. I, I, it's like God wants to, he's, in these days, he just wants to show off. He just wants to let people know how, who he is, how awesome he is, how powerful he is, how supreme, how sovereign. He's the master. He's a little, he, wants, he wants people to know who he really is. And when we're glory mongers, we're stealing it. We have to put our name in there. We, our name has to be associated with it. We have to show that it was my hands that were laid on. We have to, whatever it is. And God's saying, no, can we just be a conduit? Can we just be a place where he just comes in and flows out, comes in and flows out, comes in and flows out? That's what he wants. So let's, let's move on. He said, if we claim to be his and we walk in the spirit, then we must ask ourselves, is the spirit dead? If he is alive and we are walking in the spirit, then why are we having so little or no effect on those around us? We must learn to walk in the Spirit instead of our own false perception of the Spirit. The twelve disciples turn the world upside down, yet we can live, work, eat, and play with the same people day after day, and their lives reap no eternal value or change. This cannot be, for we must rid and remove our compromises so that we can affect a lost and dying world. Uh, this might be heavy for some, but think about it. The disciples, 12 of them, turned the world upside down. They went to city after city. They were turning the world. And then we say we're filled with the Holy Spirit's power, and yet we can be with the same people, and we're, well, we don't want to offend. We're, we're sorry. We don't want to step out. We don't want to you know, pray for them. We don't want to give words. We don't want to intercede for them. And they're staying in their same sin, and there's something wrong with that if we're really filled with the Spirit. If we're really just... Man, God's just filling us up and doing super... Man, come on, that's what He wants to do. Amen? Amen. Amen. We walk around quoting, I am more than a conqueror. I am an overcomer. But if there is no fight, no war in your life, then there's no conquering. To be an overcomer is to overcome the apathy, the sin, the lies, and the compromise of our life. So God's saying, if we're going to say we're conqueror, more than conquerors, or we're overcomers, then... There should be things that we are overcoming. There should be things in our life that we are conquering. There are things that we should be distancing ourselves and saying, wow, that thing was destroyed in my yes. life. Because how, to say I'm more than a conqueror and an overcomer when I'm still doing and living just like the world or still bound by doubt and unbelief and still bound by double-mindedness, and then God's saying, you know, we, we need to say, we need to say, where's God in that? Where's God? Because, man, the supernatural all powerful God is the Messiah. The one that for 40 years provided, I, I did a statistic, I can't remember it now, but for 40 years, God provided so much water and so much food for the Israelites day and day and day after day, and yet we sit here in a place struggle. I really believe that we've got to abandon ourselves. God wants us to be the bride of Christ so that we can flow and enjoy all the benefits that we read in the Word of God. Amen? Amen. So, I hope everybody's getting this. Jesus, it's excellent. Jesus came to take over, not to be overcome. This world will be drawn by the overcomers and the conquerors. They were drawn to Jesus, so they should be drawn to those that are walking in the supernatural power of God as well. Does that make sense? He said this world's going to be one. The harvest, this last day's harvest is going to come in because of the bride, the remnant of Christ that's been set apart. Those that aren't sitting in a circle trying to compete, but those that are out there being those wedge breakers. Pastor Randy? Yes. Go ahead. I, was... I just heard the Holy Spirit say, this is a prophetic message. This is a word from Almighty God. This isn't a word from a man that's trying to put anything of judgment or something that is his own. This came from the Lord. This is a download from heaven. This is serious. This is God. This is to be heeded and listened to. 
Nothing to be afraid of. I'm writing down, I'm going, man, I'm guilty of that, and I'm guilty of that, and I'm guilty. You know, mark it down. God's just asking us to look at ourself, and he wants to set us free from those things because we've been stagnating. And let me tell you how this has happened. This has happened because of disappointment, because of all the things that have happened over, I think, about a decade, one thing after another, and you slowly get cooked like the frog in the, in the pot of hot water. And then pretty soon, you know, the depression, the anxiety, the jealousy creeps in. All these things that he's talking about that I've written down here, they don't happen instantaneous. It happens over a period of time when we're disappointed and we've been hurt and we've been wounded and we're lashing back and we don't know what to do and then we we just develop these habits of, of walking in fear and condemnation and all those different things and let me tell you beating your own self up gossiping about your own self doing the things afflicting your own self is just as bad as doing it to somebody else I the Lord told me you get up and you say this is a word from Almighty God, this is a word from me. It needs to be heeded and listened to. God would never, ever give us a word like this unless it was redemptive and he wanted to redeem everything back to us. This is redemptive. Pastor Randy, you go on because this is a redemptive message because I've been asking the Lord, how, how come the healing's not happening? How come the, and I've been asking the Lord, why, what's going on, what are we missing? Now God is giving us some answers. Are we going to listen to what he's saying and write some of them, you know, write them down, the things that hit your heart? Are we just going to throw it away and say, well, that, you know, I, I don't like that. I just like up, uplifting. This is uplifting. Amen. Because if this sets us free, whom the sun sets free is free indeed, we're going to be lifted up high above all of this and be able to come back as conquering heroes that God has made us. I am telling you right now, God said, you get up and you tell them, this isn't a message from a man, this is a message from God. Amen. 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 So I did it. Wonderful. Hallelujah. And it is very humbling to give a word like this, but I believe because of coming underneath the authority of Shirley for this week and, and her heart for you, that um, that's why God has it. So I believe it's a safe place to, because I believe that all of you want to do great and mighty things for the Lord. Mm -hmm. and so that's why it is. It's no way, please. I am not a person who is any way bringing judgment or condemnation. I don't do that. My heart is that you would be that's equipped right. to do greater things than even He has done. So let me just finish with part of this word. And it's um, it is time to, He said, to divorce ourselves from sin. The world and the world system, the world's attitude and the devil, and come as the bride without spot or wrinkle and be truly married and in love with our Jesus. I really felt like the Lord said, you need to tell the people that I believe in divorce in one situation and one situation only. And I believe he's saying that that divorce is to divorce ourselves from the world. When we come to him, we're coming. And we're just like a bride and a groom, they come to it and they make a vow. We need to come back to our first love. We need to come back to the point where mm. we're just in love with mm. Him and He's the one we're united with, that we're truly married to Jesus. And that's what He wants, is just to lavish on us and just to pour out His Spirit. And that's what it's all about. He loves us so much. He loves every one of you so much. Yes, there's been struggles and frustrations. Like Shirley said, there's been things. I've been through stuff. I could have come up here and told you everything I've been through and things that I just could question and things that I... Two years ago, I was on a deathbed. I almost died. It was just from a bad tooth. Can you believe? It was in the hospital for three weeks. I was the one that was rushed into the emergency room. I was the one that had to be rushed on, first of all, because I was this close to God because I wouldn't go, and I was believing God for healing. God was going to heal me. God's going to heal me. Here I am in the hospital. Three weeks. But to know that in the middle of that, every night, when I'd play my iPod, for Christian music and songs that I had downloaded, there was this song that came on every night, and it was not on my iPod. It was, it was the angels, they would come in, and it was this song about, about being in the palm of his hand, and it was so beautiful. I never, and what he was telling me when I was in the hospital is, if, I, if I'm, a, I'm a big guy, I've got five kids, and when I take my little kids as a dad, and I put them in the palm of my hand, I can lift them up, and the people below, the little kids, they can jump and try and get a hold of them, but I'm bigger and taller, and I can lift them up. God's saying, that's why I am. 
I can lift you up above where the enemy's trying to attack. But also, if I've got my kid in the palm of my hand, I can bring him right in here and put him right to my heart. And God said, that's what I'm going to do. And he said, you don't worry about it. Even though everybody, you know, thought, man, I could be on my deathbed, I could be dying. God, every night, came and visited me with the song of the Lord and ministered to me. So I'm just saying, you know, um, I could talk about all the pain, all the stuff. Things have been stolen, taken from you. But I just feel like God loves you so much. This is what he wants you to hear. I'm ready to almost be done with it, but, but this is it. <laughs> he said, uh, he said uh, we see the plays and dramas where the characters jump out of the book and the whole thing comes alive. And he said, that is the way this word should be. It must come alive in our own hearts, lives, families, and churches. It's not a a, a, a fictitious book but just like you would read something just like you go to a drama and a play and somebody's acting that God's saying this word should animate us this is what animates us this is this is we do the same things that's in this word God wants his people to live in the fire the fire keeps us refined and purified he wants us to get so hot that we are smoldering coals that all who touch us will be burned, and the fire will spread across this nation. So many of my people go to work and go to church, so weak, so empty, so malnourished. This is a mockery to Jesus. We must be a well that is so full before others so they can drink from us. Amen. As the Lord. Amen. Amen. I've just done my job in delivering that. I could uh, stop right there. I don't know what the time is. I don't know how much time Shirley was thinking of this first session being, but just you got when, plenty when of the time river to do runs, whatever you want to do. You can yeah. go forever, man. <laughs> let me just let me just um, make this is is put some feet to this a little bit. And I would normally preach this a lot longer, but I'm just going to put this in the context. There's a story that we all know about. It's a man who, um, his name was Samson. If you understand the story about Samson, the Israelites have been under bondage to the Philistines for over 40 years. And all of a sudden, there was a, a man named Manoah, and he uh, and his wife, knowing that they, they couldn't have, she couldn't have a ch any children at all. And an angel comes to her and says, I'm going to give you a son. I'm going to give you the deliverer of Israel. And in that, I want him to have a Nazarite vow. Drink nothing unclean, eat nothing unclean, and don't cut your hair. And the Bible says in Judges chapter 13, verse 25, that as a small boy, all of a sudden it says, the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him. And... The Spirit of the Lord began to come upon him, and he began to understand and begin to feel and sense the anointing. He was called to be a deliverer. But the problem is, and you go to Judges chapter 14, he starts going to the Philistine people, and he starts sort of hanging out with the Philistine people. And he goes to them to find a wife instead of his own people. In fact, his parents said, why don't you look within your own nation, your own people, and your own family? Why don't you look in there? But he's going to what's supposed to be the enemy. So he's going to the enemy's camp, and he's looking, he finds a lady, that he, a woman that he wants to marry. But along the way, let me just, you know, interject some of these things. There's a lion that jumps out, and he, Bible says he killed the lion with, a bare, with his bare hands, and it said because the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. Mm -hmm. Well, all of a sudden, you know, these men were coming against, oh, this is a little battle, I'm not going to go into all the detail, but these 30 men get this riddle, and they're trying to catch him, and all of a sudden, I mean, he gets a riddle, he's trying to catch them, they figure it out by going to his wife, and finally that says, you mess with my heifer, you know, all this stuff, and he kills 30 men, again, the Bible said, because the Spirit of the Lord came out upon him. So, an angel announced that he was going to be born. He's going to be a deliverer. The young boy, Spirit of the Lord, comes upon him. All of a sudden, a lion jumps in front of him, and he kills the lion with the bear, his bare hands. And it's all because the Spirit of the Lord came out upon him. And then he kills 30 men with, the, uh, with his bare hands, all because the Spirit of the Lord came out upon him. I, I must tell you, I don't have time to, to, to give you the total revelation of this. The next thing is, is because he wants to get revenge. 
because he has some character flaws as well. So he got some, wanted to get some revenge, so he caught 300 foxes, tied their tails together, sent them in the camp with uh, firegrams to burn them. And it ended up being that this one time he did it with his own strength, showing that he had physical strength. It doesn't say the Spirit of the Lord came out of the pond him, and he tied their firegrams, sent them in, and burned the whole cross, burned the whole, and even his wife and his wife's family. Oh. So it shows that when you go in and you play, there's always a consequence and how we can't, we got to avoid the flesh and he got in the flesh, he got in that spirit of revenge and vengefulness but then, keep, keep going through, and so they get mad because he did that, so they come to the leaders of Israel and say, we want to take him out and they said, she said, okay, well we'll tie him up, give him over to you, he says okay, do that, but don't kill me they tie him, this whole, I'm just trying to sum it up real quick, so I hope this is clear enough so they take him up there, and a thousand men are ready to jump him and he kills all a thousand. This is something that is supernatural. You can't, uh, if, if there was, if all of you jumped, I mean, I might be a big guy, I might be able to, you know, I'm just, I'm not saying I'm that great, but I might be able to beat every one of you. But, if all of you just, if, if all of you but one just jumped on me, piled on top of me, I'd be at the bottom of the pile, then one guy could just jab me and I'd die. I mean, 999 guys could have jumped on top of him, but a, he kills a thousand of them with a job one of a donkey. And the Bible said, because the Spirit of the Lord came out upon him. The first time we see him even say a prayer is after that, he's crying out to the Lord, God, you don't even care, Where do I need a drink of water, give me a drink of water. Problem is with, uh, with uh, Samson, we don't see him praying, we don't see him in the Word, we don't see him being discipled, we don't see him making disciples, we don't see nothing. And I think that that would change, and he would have a different, even greater anointing if we would have seen some of that. And God's saying that's the way we need to be. We need to make sure we have somebody disciple us. We need to be discipling others. We need to be disciplined. We need to be in the Word. We need to be praying. All that. So, moving on. After that, he, like I said, as a young boy, he's intrigued with the lights of the other of the of the city of the Philistines. So he's beating their brains up during the day as a deliverer, but at night he's sort of partying with them. Yeah. And see, what happens is it started as just a little looking at as a boy, but all of a sudden now when you get to Judges chapter 15 and 16, all of a sudden it shows that he's hanging out with prostitutes, and, you know, he's got that flaw, you know, and um, we all have a flaw. We all do. So we're not here saying, well, what is it, this or that, but he had a flaw. That flaw was significant. See, let me tell you, the only thing that compromises your relationship with God is sin. The devil really can't cause compromise. The imps from hell, the devil himself, you know, it's none of that. It's really when we, see, you can't fall through thin ice unless you get out on thin ice. And we got to be careful. So whatever we are, anger, you know, unbelief, all those things, we got to, really, God wants to deal with us so that we can be the deliverers that God's called us to be. So, so he started hanging out. Well, all of a sudden, the Bible says, and I'll make this just a little bit shorter, in uh, uh, um, Judges chapter 16, um, he falls in love. Falls in love with one of the prostitutes. Her name is Delilah. Mm. And the Bible says this. It says the leaders came to her and said, um, go to Samson and see if you can lure him and find out the secret of his strength and subdue him. And I just want to tell you this, because it goes with all the prophetic words that I'm getting ready to share that everybody else shared before this. That's really the whole devil's plan. In the New Testament, it says, steal, kill, and destroy. Here, it's like lure. See, when I go fishing, I don't, buy, I don't get anorexic worms and put them on my fishy hook. <laughs> little skinny, dried up little thing put up there and think some fish is going to jump on it. No, I'll get the biggest, juiciest, fattest little worm, put it on the hook, and when I throw it out there, I'm waiting for that fish to go, yeah, climb down on it, and hook, I got him. And that's what the enemy does. He comes as an angel of light. He comes in his tool, his deception. And so he came and was trying to lure, to lure, and find out the secret of strength. Let me tell you something. No matter how bad it gets in your life, the secret of strength, don't you ever compromise your intimacy with the Lord. Because that's what happened. He was in, being in, and so he shares, eventually. But not yet. Don't get it. Don't let me get ahead. So, so, lure, secret of his strength, so we can subdue him. So what happens? She asks him, if you love me, tell me the secret of your strength. And he says, tells her one thing, boom, you know, it's not true. He lied to her, but she did what he said. And, and, they, and he sends the, and the Philistines in, and boom, he breaks forward. And it be why? Because the Spirit of the Lord came out upon him. And he destroyed them. Second time, she does it again. Come on, tell me. He tells her another thing. It's a lie. But she does it. 
I don't know why I can't catch it after the second time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. See, doesn't Philistines come, and all of a sudden, you know, he breaks loose, and why the Spirit of the Lord came out upon him. Third time, same thing. Now, after three times, I don't know what's going on, why he loved her that much to go, hey, wait a minute, I'm telling you this, and you're doing this. I'm telling you this, and you're doing this. Well, I'm not going to tell you, but the Bible says, I believe it's verse 15, and I could go there for, and it says, after three times, he, God always gives us a chance to get things worked out, right? He gives us that second, third, fourth chances, you know? But it says, that she nagged him. Well, let me just read it to you so you can see this is the enemy the way it works. It said in verse 15, Then she said to him, which is, this is the ploy of the women all the time, man. How can you say I love you when you won't confide in me? Just, just go. <laughs> My wife was here, she'd kill me. I do it, you know. <laughs> this is the third time you made a fool of me, and you haven't told me the secret of your great strength. With such nagging, she prodded him day after day until he was tired to death. Now when I think of when I think of prodding, I think of somebody that's a cattle herdsman that's got that prod and is prodding those cattle and just boom, you get in that gate, you get in that gate, and just going and you know, pricking and pointing. Well, that's what the enemy does. She nagged him, please, if you love me, please, I thought you love me. I'm not, you know. You know, I'm not going to do this if you don't do that. You're not gonna, you know, so she's nagging, prodding, and it says he got tired to death. In verse 17, I believe, that, so he told her everything. No razor has ever been used on my head, he said, because I have been a Nazarite set apart to God since birth. See, let me just go back to before the verse. Well, remember when I said, that God, you know, that word, that we're supposed to be overcomers and conquerors? How can Samson say he's an overcomer when he's not overcoming? He should have been conquering. See, God, God calls us, you know, to be the bread of life. You know, really, he's the bread of life. He lives in me. We should be the light of the world, right? right? So we're the ones that should be the ones that are conquering. See, the it should not be a hundred. I mean, it shouldn't be fifty-one me and the devil forty-nine in the, in this race. I believe it should be me a hundred, devil nothing. Right? That's what it should be. Why should I give the devil, oh, I'll let you win one. Just keep the contest close. You know what? You can have my mom. You can have my dad. You can have, no. I don't want to keep the contest close. I want to win 100 to nothing. So he's right there. He should be winning. He should be conquering. But he's not conquering. He's, he's getting defeated. He's getting worn out. The enemy is trying to wear out the body of Christ. So he told her everything. No razor has been ever used in my head because I have been a Nazarite set apart to God since birth. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me, and I would become as weak as any other man. And this is what's so terrible, is he knew the consequence of that happened. And he could not associate, three times I told you this, you did this, so I'm going to tell you everything, and I'm going to risk losing it all. And that's really what we're doing to the devil. He's nagging us, and so what happens? When Delilah saw that he had told her everything, she sent word to the rulers of the Philistines, come back once more, he has told me everything. So the rulers of the Philistines returned with the silver in their hands, having put him to sleep on her lap. She called a man to shave off the seven braids of his hair, and so began to subdue him, and his strength left him. And really, the word that I would have shared earlier is this, is that I believe that much of the church is asleep on the lap of the enemy. Whoa. And surely gave that as time to awaken. She gave that. That's why I'm sharing this at this time. Because I believe that that we need to start waking up a little bit and realizing all the ploys that the enemy's trying to shut up. Even men and women of God. There's things we go on and talk about. What happened in Houston. You know, the government demanding all their pastor sermons. I mean, there's just a lot that we need to be careful of. It's not time to let technology be our Holy Ghost. It's time to get back That's to, right. we don't need man-made, we need God-made ministry Amen. instead of this, on the Holy Spirit. Amen. It said, then she called, see what happened is his strength began to leave, and they called, she, then she called Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and thought, I'll go out as before when the Spirit of God would move on him and shake myself free, but he did not know that the Lord had left him. 
I believe it was one of the Saturday. He was an angel came to tell his mom, you're gonna be have a son, he's gonna be a deliverer. How many of you, your 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 birth was announced by an angel to your mom saying, you know what, I'm giving you this. Yeah, we all have a destiny. We all have a call of God in our life. We are the Samsons of our generation. We are to be deliverers. We're to set captives free. We're, we're God's people, God's army. Every one of you in this place, we should be doing the signs, wonders, and miracles. We are the army of the Lord. But we maybe didn't have an angel announce that to our parents. And let me just, because this is there's just some key points. Then she calls him. He awoke from his sleep. Verse 21, then the Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes, and took him down to Gaza, binding him with bronze shackles. They set him to grinding in the prison, but the hair on his head began to grow again after it had been shaved, which shows again, God always, he's about redemption. He's about redemptive purposes. And even when he had given it all away, God still, that because what is it doing? It's renewing that covenant again. It's renewing, hey, I'm just not done with you. Hey, he's letting his hair grow. He's letting his strength come back on. He's renewing that. And God is always in the house right now to re redeem and renew every one of you. Amen? Amen. Amen. So his hair began to grow. Now look, verse 23. Now the rulers of Philistines assembled to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon their God to celebrate saying, Our God has delivered Samson, our enemy, in our hands. When the people saw him, they praised their God, saying, Our God has delivered our enemy. So they're giving their God credit for their victory. And really, again, it wasn't a false God. It was really the doing of Samson. But we need to just push on. The one who laid waste our land and multiplied our slain. While they were in high spirits, they shouted, Bring out Samson to entertain us. So they called Samson out of prison, and he performed for them. God's saying, please don't let your ministries or church entertain people. We're to deliver people. All of a sudden, Samson becomes a laughing stock, and the reason they bring him out is to entertain so they can laugh. And we can't be public spectacles to be laughed at anymore. We're the ones that walk in the fullness of the power of the Holy Spirit is equipping us to do the signs, wonders, and miracles. And they said, let him perform. We cannot, we cannot let pastors or churches where we're trying to perform to build big crowns. I can't perform, I can't entertain, I'm not here to be an entertainer, I'm not here to be a performer. I'm only here to see captives set free and the body of Christ raise up so that God can raise up a remnant that can go in and be the army of the Lord to do the works of the Lord in the last days. So I can go on and tell you what happened is his hair began to grow strong. And the second prayer that we see about Samson is, as he's really committing suicide, I don't believe he had to. I believe he worked, he'd done 20 years of deliverance. He could have gone way more. He could have killed more of the enemy. We could say, yeah, 20 years, way to go, Samson. What he did, though, is there's a big party, and everybody's up on the, in, in the house, and the, you know, promenade, everybody's there, big party. And he says, Lord, just once more. And he puts a hand on this pillar and a hand on this pillar. He said, Lord, just want some more strength in me. Showing that he knew what it was like to have the Spirit of God move mildly upon his life. And the Spirit of God moved on him one more time. And he killed more in his death than he did in his life. But he still could have lived on and gone more. So, let me close by saying this. I gave a lot. I shared a lot. But if all it is is to bring it back to the last point. If you bow your heads and close your eyes this morning, this evening, there is no condemnation. It's all about redemption. It's all about Jesus loves every one of you so much that he wants to give you so much this weekend. You know what? I, I, I might have just only been able to give this word. The rest of these, these three other men and women of God, they're so powerful in the Spirit. They have so much flowing through them. They have so much, I believe the next four meetings are going to be so dynamic. I believe it's going to build off this. But let me just say this. You might be sitting here, you might be having, struggling with a lot of things. Unbelief, doubt, confusion, frustration, disappointment, depression, oppression. You might be struggling with some addiction. You might be struggling with some mindset, some issue. It doesn't have to be like blatant sin, like drugs and alcohol and sex, but it can be just fear, 
worry, stress, anxiety, whatever you might be struggling with. And you prayed and you prayed. And maybe today you can pray that prayer just like Samson. And you say, just once more, Lord God. Just one more time will you touch me, change me. If that's you today, you say it just one more time. I want you to raise your hand. It doesn't matter. Don't be afraid. Don't be always here to judge. Just one more time, Lord. So maybe you, maybe you don't want to raise your hand for that. Maybe you just want to say, I'm a, I want to empty myself out so I can be that vessel to receive the rest of the weekend. So, number one, those that are crying out for one more time. Two, those that are just saying, Lord, I just want to be empty today so that I can be filled these next two days. I want all of you to stand your feet and come to the altar. And I'd like just this prayer team, anybody else that surely has, to pray for you because I believe that this is just the beginning and God's got so much more. So. If you have anything else to share, surely I'm just going to turn over to you, Jill, Michael, anybody else. Okay. That was just awesome. God, thank you for that word. I've been in several situations uh, lately where, um, let me just get this cord.